the southwest of Scotland boasts historic towns and villages, great castles and harbours, miles of magnificent beaches, and a great deal more. The train from Largs to Stranra provides the perfect introduction to Scotland's finest holiday coast, and here and there, the magic of steam lives on. This is one of Britain's great railway journeys. Whether it's a busy electrified commuter service or the great open spaces of the Galloway Line, the scenery is always superb. Our journey takes us down the Ayrshire coast and over the hills into Galloway. We begin in the north at the busy coastal resort of Largs. Langs is at the end of the line from Glasgow. The first trains operated by the Glasgow and South Western Railway arrived here back in 1885. The town stands on the Firth of Clyde and is protected by offshore islands and by the hills which rise up behind the town. This sheltered spot has been inhabited for thousands of years. Margaret's Law is a chambered cairn in Douglas Park. Inside there were flints and human remains which date from 3000 BC. Much, much later, in 1263, Largs was attacked by the Vikings. The battle is commemorated by a monument in the Vikingar Exhibition Centre. of Lars was fought on the 2nd of October 1263. Many people would dismiss it as being a very small battle, but as far as Scotland was concerned, it was a vital battle because that is the date from which Scotland truly became an independent nation. I am Odin, the father of all the gods, lord of the gallows, raven god, ill-doer, terrifier, Father of victory, here in Valhalla, the hall of the chosen, I preside over the Viking gods. Logs settled back to normality and slowly grew in size. In 1636, Sir Robert Montgomery added Skelmorley Isle to the old parish church. This now stands alone since the body of the church was later demolished. The interior presents a dramatic contrast with the Italianate tomb and a barrel wall timber ceiling painted in typical Scottish style. Since Victorian times, Largs has developed into a popular seaside resort. Across the Clyde from Largs is the island of Great Cymru. It's only a short crossing and there are plenty of ferries. Your attention is drawn to the safety instruction notices which are displayed throughout this vessel. On behalf of Caledonian by Grey, thank you for your attention and we hope that you enjoy the crossing.
Great Cymru is just over three miles long, but the delightful town of Millport and its sandy beaches have made it popular with holidaymakers for over a century. Millport is also home to the Cathedral of the Isles, the smallest cathedral in Europe. In 1885, this small boat was established as a floating laboratory by the Cymru naturalist David Robertson, one of the pioneers of marine science. A permanent station was built at Millport in 1897 and is now the UK's premier field centre for marine biological teaching and research. For many years, a feature of the marine station at Millport has been the public museum and aquarium, uh, where visitors can come and see a wide range of marine life uh, caught locally, and also a display of exhibits of the sort of work that takes place uh, at this institution. The station also uh, provides a supply of marine material for teaching students uh, in universities throughout the UK. Before leaving Cymru, there's time for a tour of the island. The highest point is less than 500 feet, but the views across the Firth of Clyde are incredible. In Victorian times, these waters were busy with steamships, which linked the west coast of Scotland and the islands. In the summer months, it's possible to relive the experience on the Waverley, as the last seagoing paddle steamer in the world prepares to take us back to Largs. She was built in 1946 to the order of the London and North Eastern Railway and replaced another vessel of the same name, which was sunk off Dunkirk in 1940. The railway line to Glasgow is electrified and an hourly service is provided by class 318 multiple units which are operated by Strathclyde Transport. Beyond Largs, the line passes the golf course, just one of many along this coast. Opposite is the marina, with berths for 600 luxury yachts.
Kelbone is the home to the Earls of Glasgow. The original Norman keep was built around the year 1200 and is now enclosed within a grander castle. David Boyle, the first Earl of Glasgow, was one of the leading figures in the Act of Union, which united the English and the Scottish parliaments. The sundial dates from 1707, the year of the Union. The design is peculiar to Scotland, and this is the best preserved of its type. The castle also has extensive gardens, a country centre and a collection of wildlife. In a gorge beneath the castle is the Kel Burn, or mountain stream which descends via a series of waterfalls. The burn has its source on the moors above. This is the Clyde Muirshield Regional Park, over 100 square miles of unspoilt countryside. Heading south, the line approaches West Kilbride and Ardrossan, but first it passes the Hunterston Coal and Ore Terminals, where there are connections to the port facilities. Hunterson is also home to a nuclear power station. Visitors are encouraged to visit the site and to learn about the process of generating electricity. This was Scotland's first advanced gas cooled reactor, commissioned in 1976. Nuclear fission heats carbon dioxide, which generates steam for the turbine. There's also a video which shows how rigorously nuclear flasks have been tested. The station serves the small township of West Kilbride, which dates from 1306. From the shore, there are views across the water to the magical island of Arran.
first railway to Ardrossan, the Ardrossan and Johnston, opened way back in 1837. Today, a separate branch line and no less than three stations serve the town and the port. The castle ruins date from the 12th century, but the rest of the town was developed in the early 1800s, when a modern port was created to cope with an increase in traffic. Ardrossan is the main ferry terminal for the island of Arran. The Glasgow and Southwestern and the Caledonian Railway Companies both ran Clyde steamers from here. Rivalry was intense as each tried to compete for the most majestic crossing. The branch line from Largs connects with the Galloway line at Kilwinning. For such a quiet town, this is a busy junction with frequent trains in and out of Glasgow. Kilwinning stands on the bank of the river Garnock and takes its name from St. Winnin, a holy man who built his church here sometime between the 6th and the 8th centuries. In the 12th century, the Norman knight Richard de Morville founded Kilwinning Abbey. This was once one of Scotland's finest religious buildings, but it was destroyed in 1561 by advocates of the new Protestant faith. In the 14th century, the monks of Kilwinning built a water mill at Dalgarvan, just a few miles up the river. The present mill dates from 1640, but was rebuilt in Victorian times after it was damaged by fire. The waters of the Garnock power a six-meter breast shot wheel. With a little more restoration, this will soon be driving the millstones and producing flour once again. Prior to the railway grouping in 1923, our entire route was worked by the Glasgow and Southwestern Railway, the successors to the Glasgow Paisley Kilmarnock and Air Railway, which opened in 1840. Just south of Kilwinning is the Eglinton Country Park. For almost a thousand years, the Earls of Eglinton helped to shape Scottish history. Today, their once proud castle lies in ruins, but all of the glorious parkland is open to the public.
heading for the coastal towns of Irvine and Troon. The railway follows the river back to the sea. Irving has been a royal borough since 1372. Mary, Queen of Scots, has strong connections with the town and there are historic buildings everywhere. Robert Burns, Scotland's national poet, lived and worked here in Glasgow then. And visitors can see the rooms where he lodged. The heckling shop where he learned to dress flax is now a gallery. On the other side of the town is Seagate, an ancient street with a 14th century castle. Irvine also has a rich maritime heritage which is celebrated at the Scottish Maritime Museum. In addition to the usual displays, the museum has a large collection of vessels. In 1992, the Carrick, the world's oldest colonial clipper ship, was brought to Irvine. She's slowly being restored to her former condition as an immigration ship. Other exhibits are moored at the pontoon dock. They include this traditional steam puffer and the Antares, which was sunk by a nuclear submarine. is Pilot House, a unique tidal depth indicator which showed the clearance over the sandbar at the harbour entrance. Irwin also has plenty of open spaces. The parks are perfect for outdoor games and there is a magnificent beach. Room, and the class 156 diesel sprinter pulls into the station. This was the terminus for the very first railway in Scotland, the Kilmarnock and Troon Tramway, which opened in 1811. Troon was once a small fishing village, 
but an excellent harbour and two miles of sandy beaches have made it very popular with visitors. The harbour is guarded by a man-made barrier built by the Duke of Portland from the ballast of cargo boats from Ireland. Trun is best known for golf. It has five superb courses, and Royal Trun, venue for the 1997 British Open Golf Championship, is world famous. We're approaching air now, but first the trains pause at Prestwick. The station at Prestwick Airport only opened in 1994. Prestwick Airport was once the hub of Scotland's transatlantic flights, but lost a lot of passengers to Glasgow. With a new rail link, Prestwick is now making something of a comeback. One little known fact is that this is the only place in Britain visited by Elvis Presley when he was returning from Germany after his national service. Further on is the actual town of Prestwick, the oldest recorded borough in Scotland. The Mercat Cross is one of the best preserved in the southwest. St Nicholas's Kirk dates from the 12th century and was built by Walter, High Steward of Scotland. The very first British Open Golf Championship was played here back in 1860. Just a few miles away is Eyre, the largest town in the south of Scotland. The Glasgow, Paisley, Kilmarnock and Eyre Railway reached Eyre as early as 1839, and many other railways soon built their own lines into the town. Today, Eyre is still an important railway junction with passenger traffic in three directions. Much of the traditional coal traffic has vanished, but there is still plenty of freight in and out of the Falkland Yard. This Hunslet Barclay locomotive was built just a few miles away at Kilmarnock. Air is a prosperous country town which straddles the river air as it flows out to the sea. 
William Wallace, hero of Scotland's War of Independence, was active here. Cromwell garrisoned the town, and there are many reminders of Robert Burns. The old brig dates from the 15th century and appeared in Burns' poem, The Brigs of Air. records of trade from Ayers Harbour which go right back to 1197. Most of today's traffic is fish and coal. Ayer is also a popular holiday resort and there are plenty of traditional seaside amusements. Before continuing on our journey, there's time for an evening at the races. Air Racecourse is one of the best in the country and the venue for the Scottish National. to the station, an imposing structure, built in 1886, a time when all motive power was provided by steam. The electric trains from Glasgow terminate here. To the south, the route is worked by class 156 diesel sprinters, second generation multiple units, built in the late 1980s. The Galloway line follows the route of the old Air and Maybole Railway. Within a few minutes, it's out of the town and passing the small village of Alloway. Robert Burns was born here in a cottage which was built by his father. There are many other connections with the poet, including the old Kirk and the Brigadoon. The Burns National Heritage Park links all these attractions and the Tamashanta experience brings to life one of his most famous works. The 25th of January is engraved on the hearts of millions of people worldwide, for this is the birth date of Robert Burns. Traditionally, the celebration of Burns' birthday takes the form of a supper. Amazed and curious. Nothing. 
and fun grew fast and furious. The paper lowered and lowered and grew. The damsels quick and quicker flew. They reeled, they set, they crossed, they click it. Till Elk and Carl and Swart and Rick it and... Beyond Alloway is Brown Carrick Hill and the Heads of Air. This volcanic headland was once rounded by the Maiden's Line, the coastal route to Gerber. As well as the scenery, there's a holiday camp and a farm park. Melington Railway opened in 1856 and served the collieries and the ironworks of the Dune Valley. Industry has declined and the line is barely used, but a major industrial open air museum has grown from the ruins. The Donaskin Heritage Centre stands on the site of the former Dalmellington Ironworks. The ironworks closed in 1921 and the complex was converted for brickmaking. The site is also home to the Scottish Industrial Railway Centre, who have a collection of more than 20 locomotives. The railway was crucial to the success of the ironworks. The company's own steam engines, or pugs, worked the valley lines, bringing raw material to the furnaces and moving the waste. These steam engines worked the valley until the last coal mine closed in 1978. Uh, the Esher Railway Preservation Group uh, was set up 19 years ago, uh, primarily to restore industrial steam in the valleys. Uh, we moved to Minivay in 1980, and just recently, thanks to our amalgamation with Dalmellington District Conservation Trust, we've been able to look at serious proposals to restore a steam line between here, uh, Danaskin, and our other site at Minivay. Number 10 is an 040 saddle tank built locally by Andrew Barclay of Kilmarnock in 1947. This locomotive has spent all its working life in the valley. Access to the former coal board loker sheds and workshops and hope to develop the site into another heritage centre. Beyond Dal Mellington is the head of the valley where Loch Doon nestles in the Galloway Hills. The Lead Hills and One Loch Head is another restored railway based on the Caledonian railway system which once served the lead mines of the Lowther Hills. The original line closed in 1938 
but a two-foot narrow-gauge tourist line has been relayed on the old standard-gauge track bed. At 1,500 feet above sea level, this is Britain's highest adhesion railway. The four-wheel diesel hydraulic locomotive was built in 1975 by Hunslet. Today, she has the honor of hauling the first train for 58 years across a new stretch of line. This is also Walker's country, part of the Southern Upland Way long distance footpath. To continue on to Maybole and Garvan, we must return to the Galloway line. Here, north of Maybole, it crosses the River Doon. Mabel, the capital of Carrick, is built on a steep slope, and parts of the town date from the 16th century. Cross Ragwell Abbey was founded even earlier, in the 13th century, and the remains are protected by historic Scotland. A little further afield and overlooking the sea is Calain Castle. This dramatic sandstone mansion designed and built by Robert Adam was a replacement for a medieval tower house. In 1777, Calain was a masterpiece of Scottish architecture. The Jacobite rebellion had recently been crushed and this was the first time in centuries that it was safe to build a purely decorative house. Visitors pass through the armory to the richly decorated rooms in which the Kennedy family entertained their guests. In 1945, Calain was given to the National Trust for Scotland. The castle is set within Scotland's first country park, 650 acres of coastal woodland and wildlife. South of Maybole, the line curves round Kildoon Hill and follows the water of Gervan back to the sea. This is the route of the old Maybole and Gervan Railway, which opened in 1860.
On the outskirts of Garwan, the line sweeps past the distillery before running into the station. Garvan is an old town where Robert the Bruce once held court. It's bordered by hills and faces out over the Firth of Clyde. This elegant sandstone building is the McKechnie Institute, once a library, now a museum and arts centre. Amongst the exhibits are a number of relics from the railway. Garvan is the leading coastal resort in the southwest with a good sandy beach and plenty of amusements. For many years the town was an important fishing center and there's still some activity around the picturesque harbour as the boats come in with their catch. The prominent island is Elsa Craig, an ancient volcanic vent which rises over 1,000 feet from the sea. South and into the hills are the remote villages of Pinmore and Bar Hill. Pinmore is not served by a station, but there is a small pottery and tea shop. Here, visitors can watch Winifred Wright at work, creating some wonderful and unique designs inspired by the local landscape. Started off quite innocuously too, you know. Mm. Just I'll enjoy the, the form and drawing and painting it. Now I started doing it three-dimensional and mm. I mean, I've made so, some like 1,500 of these since I started. I mean, believe it or not. You know, I just couldn't believe it myself when I counted it up. <laughs> The ten-arch viaduct at Pinmore is one of the more impressive feats of engineering on this stretch of line. It was built in 1877 by the Galvan and Port Patrick Railway. These hills were once plagued by lawlessness and houses needed to be fortified, like this tower at Pinwherry. The only station on this whole stretch of line is at Bar Hill, and the trains are few and far between. Bar Hill is a quiet upland village, just a few shops and a pub. In the woods above the village is the Martyr's Tomb. This commemorates the death of two Covenanters, killed for their beliefs in 1685. Further up the river, are the impressive waterfalls of Lin Du, or Black Water.
Bar Hill is a good place from which to explore the Galloway Forest Park. At its heart is Loch Trull, overlooked by craggy hillsides with a path leading up to the Bruce Stone. In this remote wilderness, Robert the Bruce turned the course of the war for Scottish independence. From Bar Hill, the line climbs to the summit at Chermor and descends into the valley of the Water of Luce. This is remote country and in hard winters the line is often snowed up. Here at Glen Whilly, there was once a small station, now long closed. There are no more stations until we arrive at Stranra, but there are still a few sights along the way. Near New Luce, the railway crosses the southern upland way, a serious challenge from coast to coast. Beyond New Luce are the loops of Barnes Hangham, a small waterfall in Gorge. Approaching the sea, the line passes Glenluce Abbey. This was founded in 1190 for the Cistercian monks. The old viaduct is all that remains of the port road, the coastal line from Dunfries, which closed in 1965. The Castle Kennedy Gardens are laid out on a strip of land between the Black and White Lochs and are famous for rhododendrons and magnolias. All this was created by the second Earl of Stair, who was inspired by Versailles. His castle was burnt down in 1716 and is now a ruin, but the gardens live on. Rumour has it that the Lord secretly sympathized with the Covenanters. Troops who were sent to crush them were redeployed as gardeners to prevent them from doing any harm. Stranra occupies a sheltered position at the head of Loch Rann. This is the end of the line and the train runs out along a pier to connect with the ferries crossing to Ireland. The first railway into the town was built from Dumfries and Castle Douglas arriving in 1861. Even earlier, Stranra was a principal port and market town for a large agricultural region. The castle of St. John is a tower house built in 1500 and has seen service as a courtroom, jail, police station and museum.
The railway once ran on beyond Strandra to Port Patrick, where there were attempts to develop the official sea route to Ireland. The scheme fell through and Port Patrick is now a neat seaside town with a very picturesque little harbour. stands at the eastern end of the Southern Upland Way and the scenery along this coast rivals the best in Scotland. These are dangerous waters. The coast is littered with dozens of shipwrecks. To the south is Dunsky Castle, a cliff-top stronghold built in the 16th century. back to Loch Ryan and Stranra. As the ferries depart for Ireland, we can reflect on what has been a magnificent scenic journey. 